All right, so now we're going to take a look at Chenua Achebe, who is, as the textbook tells us, the most famous African writer to this day. Really what he did is he was the first author to write a truly post-colonial novel with his first novel, Things Fall Apart, in 1958. The last two authors we looked at very much tread on post-colonial issues, but again, keeping the nuances of a post-colonial culture in mind, those were really colonial texts because both Lessing and Camus were operating from the perspective of someone from the someone living in, you know, the colonizing entity, even if, you know, they disagree with that position and they critique the empire, they were still part of the colonizing force just by where they were born into society. So with the Chebe, we turn from these colonial authors to truly post-colonial authors, authors who grew up living in a country as it was colonial and then decolonizing and then post-colonial, really through all three phases. The only phase they didn't live through was the pre-colonial phase a long, long time ago. And so I've got the map of Africa here, right? You can see way down there towards the bottom, uh, Zimbabwe right here, which is uh, modern-day Rhodesia, where Lessing lived. Up here we have Algeria, right across the Mediterranean from France. Over here is Egypt, where Matthews, who we'll study in a few minutes, was from. And then Nigeria, right here, which is the home of Chenua Achebe. So, he, like I said, he's the best-known African writer today, and that's because his first novel in 1958, Things Fall Apart, launched the post-colonial literary movement. It's really, you might be able to pinpoint, you know, some text that comes close to it earlier on, but it was really the first truly post-colonial novel. And what it does is it depicts an African village in Nigeria several centuries earlier when British missionaries first arrive. And a, the protagonist is this character who's firmly entrenched in his um African beliefs and values and religious practices and will not assimilate to the British culture and basically resist it the entire time. He's a complex, flawed human character um, and not necessarily someone you'd always root for, but he really reveals the nuances of African culture. And it's a tragic story because, like I said, he's a tragic character who resists, never gives in to the way the British want him to assimilate. His name is Okonkwo. And so that was the first novel like that. And when you're looking at the grand scheme of world literary history, there are few texts that are as important as things fall apart. You know, you have some of the earliest pieces of literature, like the Bible and the Iliad and the Odyssey. You have important works from different periods. You know, Shakespeare is in there. And in terms of something that could change the landscape, of global literature, Things Fall Apart has to be right up there with those other texts I just mentioned for those reasons. And now we have a plethora of post-colonial novels, but they're really all imitating what Things Fall Apart did. And there's a quote in the textbook I'll have on here later that says, Things Fall Apart exploded. The colonialist image of Africa is childlike. So basically you had colonial writers for centuries depicting Africa, India, the other colonized places in certain ways, usually as primitive or childlike, savage or barbaric, needing the civilization and morality of, you know, the enlightened English to come save them. That was the stereotype. And so what Things Fall Apart did in giving us an African protagonist who was flawed human and resistant to the British hegemony is giving us a well-rounded, fully fleshed out African protagonist, not a stereotype. And so Things Fall Apart was the first, you know, novel by someone from the colonies who challenged the stereotypes about the colonies and set that precedent for the movement going forward. So that's why we're studying Achebe. Now let's take a little bit of a look at his 
background. Um, he was born in a town in eastern Nigeria called Ojidi, which was an Igbo, um, Igbo speaking town. And so the, the Igbo speaking aspect of it is important because in Nigeria, as in other African countries, people in different parts of the country speak different languages, and that's going to be very important as we go along and study the context here. He was the fifth of six children in the family where the father was a teacher for the church and missionary society. So his family growing up is very much like Chike's family in the story in that they were all already Christians and already very much assimilated to British culture, unlike the protagonist of Conquo, where things fall apart. And so he grew up, you know, really enmeshed in British culture. And um, we'll see how that influenced him throughout his life. His childhood would be somewhat similar to Tykes. And I mean, his mother's name was Janet. So it's just incredibly westernized culture in his house growing up. So westernized that his parents christened him Albert, naming him after Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria. So Achebe's parents were really drinking the Kool-Aid of the British Empire. Remember, Queen Victoria was Empress of India. Um, you know, the empire flourished at its height under her reign. Um, and this meant there were two cultures in Ojibwe, where Achebe was born and raised. So you had the the like traditional culture of African social customs and African religion versus like the British colonial authority in Christianity. Um, and so those were the tensions in his cult and his culture. And he grew up in the latter one there, the British colonial authority in Christianity, but he didn't outright reject it or outright reject the more traditional local customs and religion. He wanted to learn about both. He's really what I would call a child of two worlds. Um, as an adult at 18, he went to university and studied Nigerian history, really learning more about his people, their background, their customs, because like I said, he didn't grow up in a house where those things were taught. He grew up in a house where, you know, the British traditions were taught, but he also read colonial texts. And what he found in those colonial texts was what I mentioned earlier, this distorted image of African culture, you know, the image that depicts Africans as primitive, backward, savage, barbaric, needing help, needing enlightenment, needing a salvation that only the British could provide. Remember when we talked about the empire a few lectures ago in that an empire needs its subjects to support the imperial mission, and so the language uses a rhetoric that shows the greater good, the need for that mission, the, that rhetoric for it to be successful has to depict the people being colonized in a very negative way. And so Achebe encountered those texts, and what he wanted to do was study it from the inside, he said. So study, you know, what it was like to really be African, to not just be a stereotype. And that's why he ended up being able to write a novel that, like I said, exploded the stereotypes and showed a nuanced, fully human portrait of an African man. As he began to, to kind of discover his African roots and to discover the negative stereotypes written by the colonists and wanted to, you know, explode those, he rejected his British name for his indigenous name, Chinua, which means my spirit come fight for me. Very appropriate. And here's the quote. So after university at age 28, he wrote things fall apart. And this is the quote from the textbook that describes that book so well. It exploded the colonialist image of Africa as childlike, savage, and in need of the British, right? That's the that's what that rhetoric hinges on, right? You have these negative stereotypes of people, childlike, savage, etc. What those stereotypes imply is that those people need something from the colonial mission. So the colonial mission then is depicted as being helpful or sacrificial, not just mercenary, when in actuality it is mainly about resources and money, whatnot. So 
he, by giving us a nuanced protagonist, he destroys that image and other writers follow in his footsteps. You have the birth of a literary movement known as post-colonialism. On the next slide, we're going to talk about um, what happened in Nigeria during his lifetime. So this is 1958. He write, he's 28 years old. He writes Things Fall Apart. He continues to write more similar novels over the next number of years. But the 1960s is when Nigeria just exploded. So he grew up in this colonial environment, learned more in college, then wrote his first novel two years before Nigeria achieved independence in 1960. But as we've seen with Algeria, and as I mentioned with India, the road to independence is never easy. So our next slide is going to go into what Nigerian independence looked like. But first I'll mention that it didn't go well. <laughs> Nigerian independence did not go well for the Igbo speaking people. Um, the ethno-linguistic group to which Achebe belonged. So he spent a lot of his life living in the U.S. And to round out the biography here, he lived in the U.S. and taught at university there, many U.S., you know, several different prestigious U.S. universities for years before his death after living a very long life just a few years ago in 2013. <clears throat> okay, so just as I did for French Algeria, I'd like to provide the context of colonial Nigeria. Uh, which is, I would say, equally bloody, complex, and tragic. Um, so after World War II, as colonies like India were starting to gain their independence, Nigeria was torn by intellectual and political rivalries. There were what we call different ethno-linguistic groups, basically different groups or ethnicities, but the difference was based on language. They were all African, all Nigerians, but they were speaking different languages. And so these groups were intellectual and political rivals. So there was interior conflict within the country, but at the same time, they were wanting to overthrow the British Empire. So they were at war with each other and with the empire, you could say. They did gain independence in 1960, but there was still about 10 years of civil war and conflict. So the three ethno-linguistic groups I mentioned were the Yoruba, the Hausa Fulani, and the Igbo, which is the group to which Achebe belonged. And again, they were competing not only with each other, but with the empire until 1960 when they achieved independence. But then they were competing with each other. And as I mentioned, when decolonization happens, you have a country that is no longer part of an empire that controlled its government, its economy, its education for decades, if not centuries. In this case, a very long time with Nigeria. And so pulling out is not easy in civil war, the rising up of dictators, the constant changing of power. Those are really common um, struggles. And those struggles are often referred to as neo-colonial struggles because they're happening in a post-colonial environment and a lot of times they're kind of internal struggles, but they are a result of the empire occupying the country and then pulling out. Um, so these problems, the three ethno-linguistic groups competing with each other, eventually boiled over into the Nigerian Civil War, which lasted three years from 67 to 70. And things were very tense and even bloody even before war actually broke out in 67. Um, in January 66, a military coup by e Igbo off officers, so Achebe's um, ethno-linguistic group, um, overthrew the government and took power. But then just six months later, another coup took place by non-Igbo officers and a non-Igbo group came to power. I believe it was the Yoruba. And so things did not go well. That group stayed in power and thousands of Igbo were killed and driven out of the north. I mean, we all know about World War I, World War II, the Holocaust. Most of us are familiar with the genocides in communist Russia and China. But when we're talking about the horrors of the 20th century, we also have to add to that, you know, the struggle for Algerian independence, the civil wars in India after Britain pulled out, and here the thousands of Igbos killed 
when the Nan Igbos came to power in Nigeria in the late 60s. It's a tragic century. Um, when this happened, soldiers were actually sent to find Achibe. Remember, he is Igbo. And Lagos, um, which is the biggest city in both Nigeria and Africa, but it's in the north where Igbos were being expelled from. And so his wife and children fled back to eastern Nigeria, where he was originally from, and he was able to follow them um, soon after and teach there in eastern Nigeria for a while. Um, but but things just got worse, so they eventually went to the U.S., like I said. Things got worse in 1967. Um, the mainly Igbo eastern region, where Achebe and his family lived after the non-Igbos came to power, seceded, which means they left, and they formed a new nation named Biafra. Um, so it was, for a short time, three years, it was two countries, Biafra and Nigeria, with the Igbo-speaking people being in Biafra, that being their country. And then that's when the bloody civil war happened from 67 to 70. It was really bad. It had high civilian casualties and starvation. I mean, people lost access to food. Um, and it didn't end until Biafra lost. So, um, on Chibé's side, I mean, he wasn't supporting a particular side. He wasn't fighting in the war, but the ethno-linguistic group to which he belonged was the group that lost the war. And so Biafra lost, and so Biafra as a country no longer exists. It's now just Nigeria. It's integrated, but only through this, you know, this bloody war. Um, and what Achebe himself said about the government in power, the government that forced the Igbos out, said no government black or white, has the right to stigmatize and destroy groups of its own citizens. And so what we see here is how the colonizers did horrible things, but the people who live through the experience of decolonization and first occupy a post-colonial world can do really horrible things as well. Uh, because they've only known living under imperial reign, and the transition is not an easy one by any means. And so what we see in early post-colonial literature, like the literature of Achebe, is that transition, the difficulty of that transition, of tr straddling two worlds, the hybridity. And so... We can look at Achebe, and if this were a post-colonial lit class, we would study much more recent post-colonial novels and see kind of the evolution of, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, what has happened. Have these tensions kind of settled down or not? How are the post-colonial countries evolving now that we're, you know, multiple decades or multiple generations past the initial withdrawing of the empire? So... And we will look at some more recent post-colonial texts in our last lecture. lecture. All right, let's turn to Achebe's story, Chike's School Days. So, um, you know, some of our authors, like um, Camus, he had um, such a complex literary theory with ideas like plague and revolt and absurdity that I really had to kind of break down and explain, unpack for you his literary philosophy. Um, here, I think part of the brilliance of Achebe's writing is it's fairly straightforward. There's a lot of complexity hidden beneath the surface that you have to seek out. Um, but, but with that, I don't have to necessarily provide an entirely separate slide just to go through the philosophies behind the threads themselves. The threads are a little more self-evident if you will. And so I'm just going to combine the threads with the close reading here. And I'll, I'll probably do this for most of our texts as we wind down the class, these last few lectures. So it's an incredibly short story. Achebe wrote really short stories. Even his novels, Things Fall Apart, Arrow of God, No Longer at Ease, they're short compared to other novels as well. You know, you have the 
novels of the 19th century realists like Dickens and Dostoevsky that were incredibly long, these 900-page whoppers. And one thing that really changed as we move to modernism and postmodernism is the novels get much shorter for a variety of reasons. And in Che Bay's stories, like his novels, are incredibly short. But so much happens in a story that's just four pages. And so I go back to Edgar Allan Poe, who actually made the argument that the short story was superior to the novel. He critiqued Charles Dickens for writing these incredibly long novels. And I've said before about Dickens that he's one of the few Victorian authors where the idea of getting paid by the word is not true. That's not why he wrote long novels. Dickens is a genius, and I think the best writer after Dostoevsky, best modern novelist after Dostoevsky, because he's able to maintain um, a high standard of writing across these long pages. But Poe critiqued that. Poe said that Dickens and the other 19th century novelists wrote novels that were way too long. And Poe argued that the short story was superior because it was compact and explosive. So you have a similar amount of action, Poe would argue, taking um, place in a much shorter amount of space. That makes it compact. And then when you read it, it explodes on you. Kind of like how Achebe explodes the stereotypes. And I think that what Poe says is really true about Achebe's stories, because I've taught probably three or four different ones in different classes now, and they're all about this length, four or five pages. They're incredibly short. And to come back to the 19th century novelists one more time, not to go off on a tangent, but just to say that those were often generational stories where you would see grandparents, children, and their children's children. Um, that's part of the reason those 19th century novels were so long. You see that here. You have a story about Chike, his parents, and his grandparents, and they're all important to the story, and they're able, it's able to take place in four pages. So it's a compact explosive story. And because so much happens in so few pages, there's actually two parts. And so the first part is the generational story, which is the story of his parents and grandmother. And then part two is really the story of his school days, where we get the title of the story. So what are a couple of important themes we notice in the first half, the first couple pages here, the generational story? It's highly ironic and very complex, though because it's short, the complexity is hidden. So if we look at some language and kind of unpack that language and go beneath the surface, what do we find? What is ironic about it? Well, one thing to note is that Chike's family is Christian, and they became Christian when his grandmother converted. This is very similar to the household in which Achebe grew up. And they're taught basically not to take food from neighbor kids because most of the neighbors are not Christians. And so they actually call them heathens. And at four years old, you can see the impact of what Chike has been taught has on him. One day, a neighbor offered a piece of yam to Chike, who was only four years old. The boy shook his head haughtily and said, we don't eat heathen food. The neighbor was full of rage, but she controlled herself and only muttered under her breath that even an Osu was full of pride nowadays, thanks to the white man. So simple, short sentences, but so much jam-packed into them that just explodes on us now. Just one term, Osu, is incredibly important. Because as I, one of the things I pointed out that's really important about the background and context is you have two struggles going on in Nigeria. You have the struggle with the colonizers wanting to overthrow the British Empire, but then you also have the internal struggles amongst each other. And so this was a very class-based society, and the OSU were people of a lower caste. And so... You didn't have intermarrying between castes before Christianity came to Nigeria. But you have Chike's father has married his mother, someone from a lower caste. And so what you have here is a few things. The influence of Christianity on Chike in both like in his family, both positive and negative ways, right? So you have the idea that Christianity, you know, all are equal. If you're familiar with the New Testament, um, 
Paul says over and over again that he is there to preach the message that Christ came to save both the Jews and the Gentiles, which what that statement means is everybody. So the idea of a caste system doesn't really jive with Christianity. And that would seem in our Western conception like a very positive influence, right? You should be able to marry who you should marry. Tracks parents, if they love each other, should be able to marry. That's a good thing. You know, but that's not the system under which this community has operated. So the community is being exploded by this introduction of this different worldview. And even if there are some positives from that worldview, it's still exploding things. And then you have the other side of it, where, you know, they may be saying, you can marry anyone, but we don't eat heathen food. So there may not be judgment based on social class, but there is based on religious belief. And the non-Christians are heathens, to use the word the characters in the story use. And so it's an incredibly complex situation. And that complexity does not occur just between Chike and his neighbors and his friends, but also amongst his parents and grandparents, which is where we have a generational story. And what this generational story represents is conflict within, internal conflict, internal to the native community, not just struggling against the empire, but struggling with each other, even within families. And so um, you have Chike's grandmother converts to Christianity, takes the very, you know, English name of Elizabeth, which was, you know, one of the great British monarchs, and um, teaches her son to be a Christian, and her son and daughter, soon-to-be daughter-in-law are Christians, but her daughter-in-law is from this lower caste, the Oasu caste, and so that's where her Christianity starts butting up against her um, traditional values, and so you have a synthesis of past and present, and even though her son through his Christianity, is willing to say, I will marry anyone, and I love this Oasu girl, she's saying, no, 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 you can't do that, and you're insane if you're going to do that. She actually uses the phrase insane, which shows how entrenched this caste system was, and so the introduction of a different worldview is just exploding that culture, not always in good ways, and so you have like this synthesis of past and present, of the past pre-colonial African views and the present, you know, the empire coming in with these different views through the character of Elizabeth Chike's grandmother. And what she does is she's like this Christian woman named Elizabeth who's raised her son Amos, um, taking the name of one of the prophets from the Old Testament to be a Christian as well. What does she do when she doesn't like his decision to marry someone from the Oasu caste, she goes to the like old and uh, the old kind of like um, pagan spiritual leaders from the African community and asks them what to do. So she kind of turns back to her old religion, and they actually talk about animal sacrifice, which would not be part of Christianity. So you have like a synthesis of past and present, a synthesis of her old and new religions. And here's the passage. They believe these, these spiritual leaders in the local community tell her that the reason um, her son is marrying some from the Asu caste is that the ancestors were angry and must be peased with a goat, animal sacrifice. Old Elizabeth performed the rites, but her son remained insane and married an Oasu girl whose name was Sarah. Old Elizabeth renounced her new religion and returned to the faith of her people. So you see the conflict when one society comes into another and tries to map on to impose its views on this other culture, this other society. Um, you see the switching back and forth of religions. Someone uh, takes on, converts to the new religion but then when they see how it conflicts with some of their views from their own culture they want to hold on to, they go back to the old religion. So this really perfectly illustrates the conflicts that are 
the driving force of all the complexity and suffering in this colonial, soon to be post-colonial country and culture. So now let's shift gears, as the story does, to part two, Chike's school days, and look at what happens to Chike in school. One of the things that happens is he loves the English language, or at least certain words from it. And this is something very clever Achebe does. So we've talked some in part one of this lecture about the decision to write English when we read Lessing's text, which even though she lived much of her life in Rhodesia or Zimbabwe, was written in English. But she was English. Her parents were English and she was part of the English colonial side of things, even if she disagreed with that side. So it's a much more complex decision for someone like Achebe to write in English, even though he grew up in a household that bought in to the imperial rhetoric and, you know, taught him English growing up um, because he learned all about Nigerian history. He would have known both languages, the Igbo language and the English language from a young day. So why write in English? Well, he knows he's going to have a lot of Western readers who only know English. So maybe he wants his message to reach an even larger audience. And what does he want that message to be? Well, Part of it is certainly critiquing um, imperialism and specifically critiquing the imperialist rhetoric that his people were backward and needed the help of the empire, destroying that stereotype. So one thing he does is he interweaves phrases that are in Igbo throughout the text. So someone's reading this, they're going along they're like, this is in English, this is in English, but all of a sudden, bam, right in their face some Igbo. And so that challenges the reader. It kind of jars them, shocks them. It's part, you know, we talked at the beginning about realism and what does that mean, and it means actually not being able to grasp the totality of existence. That's our theme for the class. I think we see it here, because someone living in the empire, living under, you know, the colonialist rhetoric, might assume they can imagine the totality of Africa because they've read about it in books. But then they read something like this or something like Things Fall Apart, and that idea is exploded, and they no longer grasp the totality. What's well, one way of doing that? Interweaving the native language with the English language in the text. Here's a passage where that happens. And sometimes they even sang in English. Chike was very fond of ten green bottles, they had been taught the words, but they only remembered the first and last lines. The middle was hummed and hyed and mumbled. Ten green butter engine under war. And so ten green bottles on the wall, right? So what you actually have here is a blending of English and Igbo, which shows a few things. The way the students like the English language and want to learn it, um, these native Igbo students, but also their inability to fully grasp it in kind of a synthesis, a blending of the two languages, which is really what happens in the colonial culture, right? A post-colonial culture. Like we've seen this with Chike's parents. Now we're seeing with his classmates, the hybridity, the mixing together of things. That's really what a post-colonial state is. Like you have pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial. Post you can't go back to the Eden-like nature of the pre-colonial state because the empire forever changes it. And so what do you have after empire? Hybridity. You don't have perfect Igbo or 10 green bottles on the wall. You have 10 green water, Ajin Danwar. Okay, so what do we learn from this story? What is the thesis? I would say one potential thesis is that Chike is a child of hope. His mother, is named Sarah. Again, that's a Christian name that reflects all the complexities I mentioned before. But what specific Christian name is it? I think it's actually incredibly important to understanding this story. I mentioned before that the story is subtle. It's ironic. There's a lot beneath the surface because there's a lot packed into four pages. Chinua Achebe is not going to write a story that's only four pages unless he can get a lot in there. So what do we pull out of it? Well, you have to look really closely at the small things. And his mother being named Sarah is incredibly important because Sarah is a woman in the Bible who has a child. And that child is incredibly important 
and it's incredibly hopeful. It's probably the most hopeful moment in the Bible other than the birth of David or the coming of Jesus because Sarah and her husband Abraham are 100 years old. They're barren. They've never had children. And God tells Abraham, you will have a son. And so Abraham's son, Isaac, his name actually means child of laughter because they rejoice so much when at 100 years old, they're finally able to have a child. And the story talks about how, well, for one, um, Isaac has five siblings, just like a Chebe, but unlike a Chebe, he's the sixth, not the fifth born, and he's the only boy. So they've been wanting a son for a long time so that they'd have both boys and girls in their family. And so that's, to me, and Jamie adds that detail again very subtly just to emphasize even more the importance of Sarah's name. And what is the importance of her name? Indicating to us that Chaik is a child of hope. What help does he provide? Well, he's a child of two worlds. And if there's anything the post-colonial individual has to do is straddle two worlds because of all of that hybridity about which I just spoke. And so... Where do we see that hybridity in Chike being a child of two worlds? Where do we see that come through? In a few places. With his teacher and his classmates in these school days. Because he and his teacher and even the narrator love certain English words, such as erudition and explosion. Erudition means learning. And the narrator uses that term to describe both Chike and his teacher. They know a lot. There's also the term explosion. So we see... Uh, discussing of how seeds are dispersed, and Chaik lists off five different ways, but his the only way his classmates remember is the mechanized explosion way of the dispersal of seeds, because his classmates love the word explosion. And then the narrator then repeats the word explosion again in the next sentence. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the power of the English language, which goes back to my previous point and something that's so important about this text, because... The English language for a long time was a tool of the colonizer. It was a tool that enabled the colonizer to say these people are primitive, they need our help. But there could be two responses. One response could be we need to throw away the English language because it's the tool of the oppressor. Another response, the one Achebe takes is, yes, it is a tool of the oppressor, but let's think for a minute about why the oppressor used it. Because it was a powerful tool. So let's reappropriate it. Let's strike back with their own weapons. And so the English language is explosive. And that's the potential we see in Chaik. Remember, Achebe wanted to study both ways of life that surrounded him when he grew up. He went to university. He learned about Nigerian history, but he also learned about English literature. And then he chose to write English and he chose to use the English language interwoven with Igbo as his tool to explode the African stereotypes that had once been the tool of the colonizer. So he's striking back with their own weapons. And this means that through the English language, even though it's been used as an oppressive force, he can unlock something great, which is what we see in the final sentence of the story. Chai read it over and over again at home and then made a song of it. It was a meaningless song. Periwinkles got into it and also Damascus. But it was like a window through which he saw in the distance a strange, magical new world. And that strange, magical new world is a world where the English language can be used for good rather than evil because language unlocks so much potential.